All right, we're back. Flamingo Property Investing. Jeremy Harper sitting with me today, mate. You look very flash. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Is that the me. same show from last week? Uh, no. I did, I did watch it. <laughs> mate, uh, we're, you're... you're one of the best brokers there is in the game and a very good dancer as well. We saw you recently at our Henderson party doing the ones and twos. Yes. Which was good to see. Um, mate, what I thought would be an interesting topic to chat through today is uh, is you obviously see a lot of different financial situations. You probably see the good, the bad, the ugly and everything in between. Um, we work on a lot of clients together and um, we see what works and what doesn't work, right? And, and I think the, the interesting thing about being a mortgage broker or a banker or someone in the finance world is no one can lie about anything because it's all there on their statements, you know? Yeah. Yep. You know, you, at a face value, you can do a podcast and say you've got, you know, certain things, but when you provide information to someone like yourself, it's there in black and white. Yep. So you obviously see how people make a lot of wealth and have built wealth. If you've been working with clients for 5, 10, 15 years or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you see that whole journey from you know them starting out. I know we've got a lot of younger clients who are just starting, so it's going to be interesting to see where they are in 15 years' time. Um, and you see what works and what doesn't work. So I think that's what we're going to unpack today. We're going to unpack um, the best things to do when you're starting out, yep. whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, everyone starts at different times. Um, what what you see works best from a building wealth point of view, um, and then obviously once you've built the wealth, you want to be able to actually maintain and yeah and keep the money yes and it, and, and continue to grow. So let, so let's start with um with the starting out piece. Let, let let's let's run through that as to you see young people come to you. What are the things that that work and 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 the things that allow people to get into the market? You know, we're speaking about a mutual client who doesn't earn mega money. You know. Um, but he also doesn't have overly large living expenses. He mm -hmm. doesn't have a car loan. He doesn't have a hex debt. And all these things add to him now being in a position to buy his second property at the age of 21 or something like that. Yep, yep. So I think for me, when I first started my career, learning the concept around sort of active income and passive income. Mm. And if you can get your head around that really early on and understand that, okay, when you start your career, first job, first business, your active income is going to be quite low. Mm. So you, your goal is how do you replace over time that active income with the passive income? So that is get into property, get into other assets early as possible so that when you get to the other end of your career and you want to wind down that active income, you want to sell your business, you want to take a step back from work, not mm. do such large hours, you've got that passive piece to replace that. And that all comes back to compounding, getting as early as possible, starting that journey. Um, so if you think about it, early 20s, you, you just finished high school. You don't know what you want to do with your career. So you've got to, you've really got to take a deep breath. I think one of the challenges with, with some of the younger people they face is everything's thrown at them, right? Mm. So it's got to get into uni, got to go overseas, got to get that new car. And so you, you've got to take a deep breath and say, okay, do I need to go ahead and actually purchase that? Do I need to sign up for that? Do I need to go down that pathway just yet? Or wait a little bit of time to figure these things out. Um, it's so I, true because there's like the uh, the pressures of of you know the the, the environments we're in, right? It's yep. like if everyone else, you know, if I talk about my own experience at the moment, it's like you know my partner and I, we we need to talk about getting married now. We need to talk about having kids because that's what everyone else is doing, you yep. know, and that's how you feel when you come out of high school, right? It's like well, everyone's going overseas and everyone's going to university. And it's like just because everyone else is doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. Correct. So if you think about university, I mean, I went I went to university, I took six months off, I ended up finishing the degree. I, I think university is great and, and people should look at doing that. But quite a lot of people won't even finish that degree. Mm. So they'll come out with a hex debt at the end or they'll go and do a second degree or they'll go and do a master's without even actually working that career. So that may all make sense when you're 22. But if you fast forward to say in your early 30s and you're no longer working that career you've now got a 30 40 50 60 70 thousand dollar hex debt still to your name which is going to impact your ability to borrow ability to save because you're paying more more from your withholding every month on your paychecks going towards that hex just on that how, how much is it like if you have a hex debt is it they calculate a certain percentage of your income to pay it down correct so it is a percentage of your taxable income right so it scales up so you know if you start as you start to earn a bit more money you may be starting to pay sort of eight, nine, ten percent of your taxable income that goes towards that. Pre-tax or after tax? Pre-tax. But what you're finding now is with what's happened with the inflation rate, so the indexation on HEX, 7.1% last year, 
and that's a rolling average of of what's happening. So inflation. it's essentially your interest rate on that. Correct. So it's like having a variable rate that rises and decreases with inflation. And they'll they'll accrue that or they'll add that onto the the hex balance in June every year. So it's annualized every, wow. once a year. I didn't know that. So you've got to be really what a fucked model. Yeah, you've got to be really mindful <laughs> that you know if you take some time off after your hex degree that starts to accumulate in the background and is there a uh, this is off topic but is there a uh, is there a time frame on the hex debts or it's just like you pay it off when you pay it off pay it off so hypothetically speaking you're a you're a young woman or a young man it's 2024 i shouldn't assume um and you have a child mm-hmm. and you have 10 years or five years off work whatever it is that hex debt's still there and then you get Correct. back to work but during that time you've incurred interest and that interest is also compounded as well. So you're like yep. not paying anything off it Yep. and your interest now is growing. So your hex debt, you might've had five years of paying it off, but then you have five years off work yep. and all of a sudden your hex debt's actually larger now than what it was when you started. Correct. So if you that think- That is interesting. Yeah. So you think about big picture and I'm seeing this with, you know, some late 20, early 30 clients where they've all come through uni, they've, they're now earning good income, but the hex is still there and they can't get on top of it or they get on top of it very slowly. So- you know, if, you, if you're going to go to university, fantastic. Make sure you finish the degree. Make sure you actually utilize that, that mm. degree. Think about if you want to do a master's, maybe take some time off between getting into your career to make sure that, hey, I actually want to go and do my master's. Mm. I actually want to continue on this career um, because that's going to have a huge impact. For sure. And then and then just on serviceability piece. So like, you know, like we said, we come out of university or come out of school um, the good thing about school is if you went to a private school, often your parents are paying for that and you don't have to think about it, right? But all yep. of a sudden, then you go into university and mum and dad say, time for you to be a big boy or big girl or be whatever. Yep. Um, what impact does it have on serviceability? And we well, obviously, we have a lot of younger clients, right? So yep. when we are, are, are working on clients together, often this is a thing that comes up. Hey, if you, there's often three scenarios. It's like in your current situation, if you get rid of your credit cards and do X, Y, and Z, and if you delete your hex debt, get rid of your credit cards and do something else, like there's the three different servicing numbers. Correct. So what impact usually does like hex have on servicing, roughly? Yeah, so again, it, it works out to be, you know, if someone's on sort of 90, 100,000, that could be five, $600 deemed repayment per month mm. on the calculator. So that can that can have quite a significant, as you're, so it works, the higher income, the greater the, the reduction impact. on your borrowing capacity. Fascinating. So for some people, if they've got a small balance outstanding, it may be better to pay that out. That's right. And I was just going to say that. And then you know, like- if it's an investment loan, increase your deductible borrowings that you can claim on your tax because the hex is obviously non-deductible. That's a TikTok video getting made just after this. First home buyers. Yep. Earning less than one twenty-five, is it in New South Wales? Yep. First time buyer incentives. Mm-hmm. Those people have got 60, 70 grand saved. They only need to use 30 or 40 of that. Often mm-hmm. it's probably best to use the remainder of that cash to decrease your hex to zero, yep. which will then increase your serviceability. Yeah. But also then they go and update payroll, less is withheld off their pay slip every fortnight a month. So they're getting more money in their back pocket. You're getting a high net pay. Correct. Plus. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. That's fascinating. So this is people, this is the things that are probably a few pitfalls that people maybe don't think about, like oh yeah, I'll just go to university. Yep. If I don't like it... I've got to do another degree. Yeah, and because they're not feeling like they're paying for it up front, it doesn't actually matter because out of mind, out of sight, right? Yeah. Um, or out of sight, out of mind, whatever the fuck it is. It's one of the two. Um, okay, so that's the first one. Really think about whether this education you're about to go down is going to be advantageous or whether it's not going to be advantageous to your, uh, Correct. To your long-term career growth. Correct. And then the other things are things like, you know, be really mindful around, okay, I'm 21, I can go get a credit card. Do you need that? No, mm. you don't. Car loans, avoid, you know, buying cars in cash because, again, these sort of things will start to follow you into your late 20s mm. and that's going to start to impact your ability to start getting into that property. And let's talk about the credit card thing as well because, again, misconception, I heard it so much when I was coming out of, you know, school, I was quite young, obviously, into the workforce. Get a credit card, Jack, because that'll be good for your credit rating. <laughs> You heard that once or twice in your life? Yeah. Was that a slogan designed by the banks? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's very much an American system. We are starting to become more around the American system around how we report our credit like comprehensive history. credit reporting. Correct. Right? Yeah, yeah. But the end of the day is you just need to have, you know, maybe a phone bill that will that will go onto your credit file. Yeah. Start to So so thinking that you need to get a credit card because it's gonna be good for your credit rating or credit history or whatever you wanna call it, which will then be positive for when you buy a home is absolute BS. Correct. I mean a bank is gonna look at someone who's twenty three, twenty four and say, You're young, this may be your first bit of credit that you're applying for. And they, they get understand that, right? that. 
it's yeah, not see, I was 18 years old rolling around with an Amex in my wallet like I was a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't need it. All right, so that's something else to think about is like make sure you're not getting yourself in unneeded personal debt early in life. Yep. Again, because of the society pressures or society norms, right? Correct. And then, and then as you go through your 20s, everyone wants to go to Europe. Mm. Okay, maybe that could be a once-off maybe bootstrap it. I did the Europe trip. Set yourself a bit of a budget, but you know, don't make that something that you want to do once or twice a year because you're not you don't have the fu- the finances or the funding to to actually support that. You know, I've seen people go and take a personal loan to then fund that European trip. I would say that is the vast majority of people. Right. So that's that's horrible horrible like financial if, if, kind of if decisions. If you're early to mid 20s, I don't know how much people earn, you know, but I would say most are earning between 80 and 120. Mm-hmm. give or take, you know, some less, some a little bit more. You're usually paying rent because you're living out of home with your friends, which I think is good for life experience, not so good for the financial side. Yep. You're not saving. Mm. And to go to Europe, basic Europe trip, flights, maybe a Kentucky or something like that, you live in like a bit of a pleb over there, like with food and drinking, it's 15, 20 grand. Mm. Like there's no change out of that. And most people aren't having that sort of cash sitting in their bank, right? Because everyone's like, oh, it's so hard to save. Yeah. So I reckon most people are the personal loan or, or paying for it on the credit card. Yeah. So once you take... So if someone comes to me and they're, they're 28 and they've got a little bit of a hex, that's fine because they've and they're working their career. So that's they're getting a return on that. Maybe they've got a car loan. Again, that might be okay because if they use the car for work and mm. that is an but asset. But often you don't need... But you don't need that fancy yeah. car. But if they've got a car loan, personal loan, a credit card, there's not much... At that point... There's not much a broker. And let's talk about it. So that, there are three things that you don't need, right? And and I'm thinking about two clients we're working with together. Um, one, a young couple. I actually went to school with one of them. And uh, another young single guy. Neither of those two have either of those things. Correct. And they're both onto their second properties. Correct. They're both being career focused. Yep. I don't believe either of them have hex debt. Mm, no, I don't think so. No. So... There we go. Great example. Both of those, you know, guys, girls crushing it in the yep. start of their life, both onto their second assets, and neither of them have those, th- you know, th- three things. Yeah. Um, which is keep that top of mind, listeners, because when we get to the other end, you're going to see the impact it has when you don't do these things. When we start talking about building wealth and then keeping your wealth. Correct. Correct. And I mean, I mean, I look back when I was young. I th- driving a Corolla with a, a half, the door, half the door would, would fall out when I get down the highway. But, you know, that was just, that's the, that's the stage of life you, that, that you're going through. Exactly. I can't talk on cars though, because I am a little bit of an overspender when it comes to vehicles. <laughs> and then on that, so as you're going through your 20s, I, I call it the, and this is probably more for sort of the, the male audience, but you know, the three-headed hydra, right? So it's... The three-headed hydra. So Greek mythology. That's so very stoic. Alcohol, you. number one. Oh yeah, gambling number two, and rec- haven't been a gambler. But and recreational can, drugs can appreciate, it. and yes, I can appreciate that as well. I've seen that. Well, I've seen a combination or individually those three wipe out someone's finances completely, completely. You know, you know, destroys their their relationships oh, to the, the extreme. But for the for the everyday person that goes down to the pub on a Friday night, pulls out a couple of hundred to play on the on the Slaps pokies. The pokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, alcohol and then gets on gets on something later in the night. That's just going to destroy their savings plan. Yeah, and it's going to you know it's going to push them back further and further and further because you feel like you're in a hole, right? Like I can't get out of this hole, and often the reason is because of actions. It's so true. Alcohol, you know, it, it, those three things usually don't happen with the first one being alcohol. If you can limit yep. your consumption of alcohol, um, that will then limit your want or need to go out. Because when mm-hmm. you go out, you drink. When you drink, you usually gamble or do substance, and that leads to all the other bad stuff. Yep. Um, very, very true. Because even that, like you think about it, going out, I mean, I don't go out that often, but I remember when I was younger, mm. you would spend easily 150 to 200 bucks on drinks. Yep. Easily. easily. And that's not even that much, right? Like what are you paying now? Eight to 12 bucks for a vodka soda or something? Oh, I think 15 probably, yeah. to 20 for like a vodka Red Bull, maybe more. Yep. So what's that? 10 drinks, 15 drinks. Most people are drinking that on a night out from like a 6 p.m. to a 4 a.m. That then goes into, so you spent two or 300 on, on drinks, two or 300 on whatever goes in your body. Um, gambling, no one's putting 10 in a pokey. <laughs> usually either yellow or a green note. Yeah. See, before you know it, you're eight, 900 bucks in the hole. Yep. And that, for most people, could be 80 to 90% of their weekly wage plus rent plus your car payment. And all of a sudden now, that's when you're slapping your credit card at the end of the week because mm-hmm. you've 
overspent dramatically yep. in uh, in the want or, or, or the uh, maybe, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe the privilege of being young, you know, in quotation marks. Yeah, yeah. And that goes back to that sort of, that lifestyle arbitrage and going back to the example of the client before where as your income starts to increase mm. and your career, you start to work really hard, you try and maintain that lifestyle. So just try and be a bit more frugal. You don't have to be, you know, completely count your pennies, but and maybe have your hobbies that you're going to spend a bit of money on. Maybe you love your gym, so you, you're going to go to the, this great gym, personal training, that sort of fantastic. But then just be a bit more frugal and thoughtful about where your money's going and other items throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And if you can maintain that over a long period of time, that's how you start to save that first deposit and then you start to get yourself on that journey. Agreed. And like we, we talk about Nick, you know, who, who works in office, I always talk about he's the f- number one saver in the world. I've never seen someone who saves more money than him. Yeah. And uh, he's a prime example of that, right? Like he doesn't have a fancy car, but he owns it. Doesn't live a fancy lifestyle, but he lives within his means and his savings ability from my understanding mm-hmm. is like 70% of his income. Yeah. You know, but he doesn't pretend to be someone he's not. Correct. Correct. Um. All right, so that is the things that we want to avoid. They're the pitfalls, right? Because you you start off in life, like you said, you've got the society norms. University is something that you think you have to do even if you know, you're know you not 100% certain on the career path. So probably take a breath and maybe don't get into that forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 worth of hex debt because mm-hmm. that can have a dramatic impact. Like on average, this may not be like an Australia-wide, but from your clients or the people that you say, how long does it take to pay off a hex if you're well, that's the thing, an because- average person? Because the the cost of doing a course has skyrocketed over the last sort of ten years, right. so people used to finish maybe with a thirty forty thousand dollar hex. Mm. That's now sixty seventy thousand. So I was seeing a lot of people would sort of finish paying off the hex late twenties, early thirties. That's now been pushed out to sort of mid thirties, wow. late thirties, probably even the forties for some people. People who do those like multiple degrees, right? Especially if they're not working until very late. Like we get a lot of clients who are in the medical field. Yeah, and like I've got. You know, one client I'm thinking of who um, be like mid to late thirties now, two children, and like just finishing the studies to yep. you know to be like in the in the top of their field, and their income will come off the back of that. But I can imagine they ain't paying cash for that education, right? Yeah, correct, correct. Um, so yeah, that's that's and the longer that carries on, the more impact that's going to have on their individual budget and obviously the ability to borrow as well. Mm. Let's talk about you know the 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 renting versus buying thing because I know. I never moved out of home until I owned a property. Mm-hmm. And I obviously started working when I was young, being 15 years old. Yeah. But when I moved out of home, I rented in a share house. I think my rent was 150 to $200 a week, give or take. Um, but my thinking around it was, this is actually not dead money because I own an asset right now. That's, I own multiple assets at that time, but it was already growing in value. So even I was paying rent, yep. The growth of those assets was well and truly outweighing what I was paying in rent, so I didn't feel bad about it. Yeah. But I think a lot of people move out of home earlier than they need to. They use the excuse of "Oh, I don't want to live at home with mum and dad anymore." You know, it's not cool. Blah blah. blah. Yeah. Um, and then they get into that rent cycle, and all of a sudden, and then they live by themselves, or they just live with one friend. And all of a sudden, it costs them an arm and a leg. Um, what do you see with that, like the renting versus buying thing, and how many people get out of home rent and then often go, "Fuck, it's been eight years now, and I'm still renting. I need them." A lot of people move back home to yep. save the deposit. Correct. You know, like my brother was one of those people. He moved out with his partner. They were together for ages, and then like eventually, the reality sets in. Like we want to start a family. We don't want to be renters when we start the family. Yep. But all of our income's going, so the only way we're going to be able to do that is minimize those expenses, and that they move back home one year, save the deposit, and then bought the home. Yeah, definitely. And this is. Going back to that, if you've got the ability to live at home mm. and potentially get into that first property or maybe move into that property as a first-time buyer and then down the line rent that out, definitely I'd be taking advantage of that. I mean, we're in Sydney, so it's such a transient city. There's a lot of people that come from the UK, Ireland, wherever, that don't have the ability to live with mum and dad. So they come here, they start to rent, and then I do see with those type of clients – they need, you know, they're starting their own family. They can't be in a share house. They need their own space. Yeah. So then it does become a question of, oh, well, I can pay this rent or I can go and buy something. Yes, it's going to cost us more, but to get off that rent, that rent train because they don't have any other assets. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, essentially in short, if you get on, you know, you become a renter, there's nothing wrong with being a renter at all. I'm a renter myself now. Mm-hmm. Um, but you always want to be thinking like, your your surplus cash needs to be going somewhere. You know, you yep. can't you can't just be a renter and not build an asset base because yep. as we now start getting into the building wealth topic of this of this all the building wealth section of this podcast, you're then gonna see that 
it takes a very, very long time to build wealth mm-hmm. if you've done all of these things, which are the pitfalls, and then try and start late in your life, which you see constantly, right? Yeah, correct. And, you know, I think getting to that next phase, people then wake up one day and say, well, hang on, I'm, I'm earning really good money now. Mm. And and right now we're, we're in this sort of, this pressure point as as a Australian household economy, not necessarily the overall economy, but for households, right? It's a pressure point where there are people earning really good income. They're going, hang on, like where's that money going? That's Jack Henderson. But we're, we're paying historically high taxes on an individual level. Mm. And then also you've got inflation on top of that. And then you've got high you know, housing costs are either rent or mortgage. So it is very hard right now for people to sort of hold on to some of that, that income that they're actually earning. Yeah, of course. And then they've got uh, the need to wear Gucci and, you know, <laughs> go out and all the rest of it. Yeah. Like that's, you know, if you're frugal, you can still save money. But Definitely. You know, there's, it's not just the cost of living, it's the cost of optional living. Correct. Because you choose to do a lot of the things that you do, right? Correct. So, so let's talk about that. So you've... So, so as you're going through your late teens, mid to late twenties, you know, people in their early thirties, they're the major pitfalls that will catch up with you, even mm-hmm. though they may not be, you know, some, somewhat, uh, um, I guess, noticeable at the time. Mm-hmm. Hex debt, for example, you get that, and it feels like nothing changes in your life. Yep. Renting, for example, doesn't really feel like it's a big deal. Getting the car loan, oh yeah, it's only a hundred bucks a week or one hundred and fifty bucks a week. All those bits and bobs that at the point in time don't feel like much, then you start to get into a point in your life where you then start thinking about, all right, well, like you said, earning good money, maybe you want to start a family or, or, or really give this thing called life a, a go. Yep. Then we get into the building wealth side and you're so far behind the people who just made a few, not even big decisions, but a few decisions that were somewhat calculated. Mm-hmm. You know, like we talk, look at these young clients that we've just been mentioning, they're in their 20s. You fast forward 10 years, they're in a significantly better position yep. than someone who's done all of those things that we've just mentioned and wants to get started because yep. they've got no capital behind them. Correct. Yeah. And and you, you start to really, you go on this accelerated pathway mm-hmm. and it, I, I guess people right now we're sort of being taught to think in the moment. So what's, what's my rent today versus what's the mortgage? So I th- we put together an example, like you look at say Waterloo, yeah, let's, which let's is- Let's get the example up. Let's you know, Waterloo, what, 3K from the CBD. Yep. The, me- the median rent, I think we, is about 3,400 a Two month. bedroom apartment, three bed for, uh, three kilometers from Sydney. Median rent's 880 a week, which yep. is 3,800 bucks a month or yep. thereabouts. Now to, to take out a mortgage, I think we said for about 980 was the medium. So median value is 955 and 80% loan on that, which takes into account you've saved some cash and you're putting down cash as a deposit of 20%. You got a loan of 764 at a 6.15% rate. You're paying forty six hundred and fifty five dollars in repayments, that's P and I. Yep. Plus you've got five hundred dollars a month in holding costs. You know, for example, Strata and all the rest of it. Yep. Yeah. So there's about a thirty five percent difference between That's right. So you've got you've got fifty two hundred dollars per month for P and I yep. plus your uh, your holding costs, um, in comparison to the thirty eight hundred. So you like like you said, thirty five percent cash flow difference. Correct. Yeah. And I and I think the the key what I'm trying to get to there is we're all taught, if you listen to the media, what's rent, what's the mortgage, oh, I'm better off renting. Okay, well, if you're thinking the moment, but this is where people's mindset starts to separate a little bit. If someone says, okay, well, maybe maybe I'll, I'll live in this, pay the P&I, and then I'll rent out in the future or hold on to it. Yes, there's going to be a cash flow difference that you have to come up with between mm. the two scenarios. And that means more money out of your back pocket, less spending on dinners, etc. But what does that look like in a couple of years' time? You've now got equity into a property. That's right. Assuming assuming the property holds value. I mean, if you value, bought an apartment in Waterloo, you probably would be behind the eight ball. But let's if we use a good location, a Henderson Advocacy approved location. <laughs> yeah. So assume it's held its value, or it's grown a little bit. Yeah. You're you're building equity into that. So in three four years time, we can go back and draw that out. That renter, if they if they haven't made the equivalent investment over that time. Mm they're now behind the eight ball. And that's, yeah, that's where you right. start to see that that sort of different And then pathway. often that surplus cash flow, which is cheaper to rent than own, yeah. is wasted anyway. Correct. It's lifestyle. Money. And that is, that's where you start to go like this. It's a completely different scenario and outcome between the two the two sort of households. For sure. And let's go into that now. So you're, you're seeing those two households now, right? You're seeing the people who started in their 20s and are now in their 30s and come mm-hmm. to you. Yep. And you're also seeing the people who didn't do that in their 20s and are now in their 30s and are just starting. Yep. So what, what does that look like? Like, Obviously, the difference is the guys who started in their 20s or, or their late teens, whatever it was, they understand 
leverage, they understand finance, they've been through it before, they understand owning a property potential or investing in other asset classes in comparison to someone who hasn't yep. and is then just learning everything. Correct, correct. And I think, you know, it's having that long term mindset around, okay, what is the what's your five year goal here and, mm. and your ten year goal and seeing how we can use over that time the leverage of the existing properties to get into the next one mm-hmm. to help build that portfolio. And this is where you start to the, the clients start to build on their knowledge. So I think having really good accountant, mm-hmm. you know, in their toolbox to call up, educate them to say, okay, this is what we want to do. Great. How do we get there? Potentially someone from Atlas Wealth. Correct. So someone who, who, you know, we want to use, okay, what entity do we want to buy the property and how do we want to, how do we want to add value as, you know, doing a renovation, mm. getting that uplift? Can we get a dual source of rental income on that property to help with your cash flow? And that's where you start to think a bit more long long term mm. and maybe even sit down and say, okay, well, that's our goal. We need to now go and save an extra 30000 of ourselves plus we'll tap in the equity from a refi, get some equity out, combine that for the next property mm. and it gives someone that sort of that plan in, in the short and long term. And I also think another thing on top of that, it's like even if you only just make the one good decision, right, which is just buy a property early. Mm-hmm. Or invest early. The, the difference between just buying a property early and investing into, um, say, another asset class like shares, for example, just buying a property only needs the one cash injection, which is like if you're a first home buyer in you know, 2024, your 5% deposit, you go in, bang, you've got something. Mm-hmm. You've got a full savings account because you've got to meet a mortgage every month. Yep. But you don't necessarily need to then save more money to inject, right? Where if you're investing in equities or investing in a share portfolio, it's consistent contributions, which is what people really struggle with is consistency and making sure they're strict. Yep. So the good thing about property is if you only buy one property, let's say you do it when you're 20, and then you go do all this other shit, you get a hex debt, you go traveling to Europe, you get the car loan and all the rest of it, you could have $1,000 in the bank when you turn 35 years old, but just because you've been forced every week to have the two or $300 a week coming out of your pay pack to go into the mortgage, yep. and if you bought a good property, you've held it for 10 or 15 years, you, you all of a sudden now are in just like the incredible financial position because you've done, you've made negative financial, most mostly negative financial decisions, but you made one decent decision and that property now has gone from 500 to 900 or 1.2 or 1.3 or whatever it is, you've paid down some of the debt. So the $500,000 debt now might only be 350 and all of a sudden you're sitting on eight or $900,000 worth, worth of equity, mm. which is like your nest egg to start your family to go and have the options, right? And like you say, like to leverage off of to go and do the good stuff. Correct, correct. And have you seen that a lot? Like people who, you know, you work with a lot of expats, right? So maybe someone who at the start of their life, you know, started their career when they bought the property and then they got the travel bug, they split up with the partner and then wanted to go live in another country. And, yep. you know, all of a sudden they do full circle, come back to Australia, they've wasted all their money overseas because they've been on really good tax-free income. Yep. But now they come home and they've just got this asset that's been sitting there for... Correct. And they can leverage years. that again yep. to either, you know, buy another place to live in or move back in and then leverage that to buy further property or even mm. if they want to you know take out some funds to invest back into the share market or, or, or other assets business, like, or in their know, business that was Correct. the thing that helped me when i started the business was this wasn't like i needed to plan okay i gotta save for three years make sure i'm really tight it was like i had a property or two or three properties the market had moved yep all i had to do was show income from the mines that i went back to the bank with and said hey can i get some equity out that equity then become my cash buffer still held the properties Jumped out of the mines, didn't need to worry about an income. Yep. All of a sudden, I had a safety net. My worst case scenario was I ran out of buffer. I went back into the mines. I got a job, continued servicing the mortgages. Best case scenario was where we are right now. Correct. Which is the option property gave you. Yes. Right. Correct. And so, a good point about cash flow. I think in this segment, cash is king. So you've mm. got to have a cash buffer. Have it. Have some funds in the offset account because during this stage of your life, things will get a bit tight in terms of your monthly cash flow. There may be months where you've got negative cash flow. Mm. That's okay. But if you've got nothing in the bank, things can get a bit squirrely right there. But if you've got a bit of a cash buffer for those months or that six-month period, you know, if you think about it, you've got, you know, maybe someone goes on paternity leave, right? So you go down to one income. Maybe there's an illness. Maybe there's a job loss. Maybe mm-hmm. there's a changing career. Maybe you go back to study, start your business, business slows down. There's all sorts of variations there where, you may be earning really good money that comes down for a period. And then I think also, sorry to butt in, but also other things that like are more negative, right? Like how many people go through a, a breakup late, late in their 20s or in their 30s and they go, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm going overseas for six months. Like that is a common thing, right? Yep. Or 
life doesn't turn out the way they thought it was. They're in the tech sector, for example, over the last X amount of years Mm -hmm. or recruitment in the tech sector. You're on big money all of a sudden, gone. Like you get, you lose your job. Yep. And they're hard to replace, you know? So I think it's right. Having cash buffers is is incredibly important. And so that's the, that's again, that's another fork in the road. Some people may just throw their hands up there and say, too hard, I'm going to sell a property, you know, and that's where potentially they could cut their teeth on some potential profits or they say, actually, no, I've got some cash here. I, I, I'm comfortable. I've done my budget. Even with this decrease in income, I'm okay for the next six months. Mm. And then I can find another way to pick up some additional income during that period. And I think that can hold people steadfast into long term. And that, and again, that's where you might go from someone that's maybe got one or two properties, they sell one, they're back to one or zero, to someone that in 12 months time goes from two properties to three to four. Mm. And that's a big, yeah, big difference right there. Mega difference, you know. For, you obviously know Frankie from our team. Um, he was one of the people who was frugal with the money, didn't live above his means, all the rest of it. Um, had two, two or three properties with his first partner, wife, whatever you want to call. Um, went through the divorce, split up. If you didn't have anything, most people would get sunk by that, right? Because even if you got no assets, you split whatever you have, which is usually superannuation, yep. cash, all the rest of it. Generalizing, but usually there's one party that gets more than the other. Um, but with Frankie's scenario, he had three properties or two properties, split up, sweet. Frankie had a decent income, was able to get some equity out to pay out the partner. So, you know, the partner went off and, and did what they did. Frankie still held all the properties, was a little bit tight from a cash flow point of view. Yep. But all of a sudden, you get some really good growth in the marketplace. Yeah. He lived a single life for a few years. And that then, again, was like, you like you look at a stock market, right? Or any graph and it's like up and down and you have your little dips. That there was a difference between going like that and having a massive dip down yep. to zero as opposed to just a little bump in the road and then shooting up again. And that's such a good point, right? If you you can never replace those potential equity growth on a couple of properties with your wage. Mm. So if, as you say, if you sold them and you've missed that opportunity, you've missed that huge wealth generation mm. right there. That's right. Because you get you have the option, you know, when the, when the worst happens to hold, like to retain. As long as you've got serviceability and you know, all these other little variables... But you have the option to go, okay, sweet, we had a relationship breakup or, you know, I lost my job or I do all these other things. Like, what are the little things that I can leverage off now yep. to maybe take me back one or two years, but yep. not five to 10 years? And that goes back to the cash flow and, and having that long-term understanding what's happening in the market, mm. you know, broadly speaking. So if you're sitting here and you go, things are feeling a bit tight. I'm a household, I've got a couple of young kids, I've got a mortgage, it's feeling a bit tight. You just got to think long term. You know, July tax cuts are coming through, so everyone's going to get a bit of relief there. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter what your income is, there'll be something there. So you have a bit more money coming in every month from that. Rates may look to even out, which they have. Maybe this is the top. You know, I can't speculate, but perhaps the you know there might be a rate cut late in the in year. In the not too different. In so then you think, right? okay, what does that look like on a monthly point of view between a potential rate cut? Potential tax cut coming through that gives you a bit more relief in the next sort of twelve months. Yeah, exactly. It's not it's not getting caught up and being reactive in the short term. Yeah, and that's the, you know when we get into this building wealth phase, um, again you could have done everything right in your twenties, mm-hmm. and when we say right, like right from a wealth creation point of view, doesn't necessarily mean right. You know, people commenting on these little clips going, oh yeah, but you didn't experience anything and you could be dead tomorrow and fucking blah, 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 blah. I get that shit all the time. Yep. Which is true. You could be, but you also may not be too. Like you have a much higher probability of living to 90 than you do of dying at 22. Yep. Um, so, you know, you, you do everything right, but then you get to the building wealth stage. You're just starting to get some momentum but then you don't have the right cash buffers in place or you make reactive decisions because you've overextended yourself or yep. you know, you've done things that you maybe shouldn't have done and all of a sudden all that hard work that you've put in now starts to unravel, right? And, and we've seen it with not only clients but a lot of people out there in the marketplace where it's like rates are going up, oh, we're going to sell now, being yep. reactive, you know, not, not forward thinking and going, rates were at 2% only, what, 24 months ago? Mm-hmm. We had three or $400,000 worth of equity in our property. We didn't access the equity. Now servicing's completely decreased. Rates are now six and a half percent. Bank won't give us the equity, so you don't now. You now can't go and get that buffer out to put in an offset account. Yep. To give you 12, 24, 36 months worth of cash flow buffer, yep. and you don't have to worry. Correct. You know, I mean, learning from ex- the experience of others, but I, I bet you right now, because that would happen to a lot of people, 
we've got the investment property, we've got the owner occupier, we've got heaps of equity in it. I see it on my comments all the time, but rates are too high now, we can't service. 24 months ago, rates weren't high though. Everyone knew rates were going up, like it was constantly in the media, even though Philip Lowe said it was meant to be further down the track, mm. it was still coming mm. and people didn't forward plan. They didn't go, let's go refinance out some of that equity. Let's go and make sure we've got some cash buffers there. And now they're being reactive and you have to sell down a property in a down marketplace, pay the capital gains tax and all the other shit that comes with it. You might actually net out nothing. Yep. That doesn't help your situation. Whereas if you can ride through these you know, times, you look six, 12 months down the track, rates do start to come down a little bit. Optimism comes back into the marketplace. The market mm -hmm. rallies by 10%. Credit opens up with the lenders all of a sudden. No longer a 3% buffer rate, might be a 1% buffer rate or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're back in the game, bang, yeah. bang. And you can all of a sudden make these huge leaps. But if you had to sell during that time or you had to take two steps back, you can't just all of a sudden then take those massive leaps when the marketplace recovers, right? Correct. And coming down to the lending piece, you know, there's, you, you know, looking at working with a the broker, there's multiple banks outside the big banks that are more solution focused. Mm. Yes, there's going to be a higher rate. There's going to be fees involved, but... Is that going to get you what you need in the short term? And then, as you said, you can look to refi out or exit that product into the future once it's served its purpose. And this is all the learning thing, right? Like you, you do this in your 20s, you learn all these little bits and bobs and then you get to your 30s and shit happens and all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, I can do this or I can plan for that. Yep, correct. Another one as well, which is just another like, you know, a, a, a good example from a friend I spoke to recently. Um, same thing, we worked in construction together. He had a partner at the time went and bought their first home out in um, out in Northwest Sydney in one of the house and land estates. Anyway, built it, did really well, split up with the partner, bought it out. He started a business, business was going great guns, few things changed and that business didn't do as well and he's now having to liquidate the business. Now, if he, he has, still has the property and he's able now to not to go to a major lender because his servicing's cooked, but he's been able to go to a second tier lender or a non-bank like a Resimac, for example, mm -hmm. cash out some equity from that property to now pay out some of his debts to liquidate that company. And instead of him now having to go bankrupt, he's been able to leverage off a property, yep. get rid of some debts, liquidate a company, made a mistake, off to the races again. But he's now still got the property with his like foundational that piece yeah. to go. To, and then again, market rallies 10%, starts a new business, does a really strong year, you know, first 12 months, and all of a sudden you're back in the game. Yeah. So um, that's just another great example of like how just making, that was only one good decision he made. Mm-hmm save for one year and buy a house as opposed to go to Europe or do whatever. Go to Europe, get you in your car. Yeah, yep. you know, it's like that, that sort of shit. Okay, moving forward. Um, we've spoken about delayed gratification. Obviously, this is all these things like delay their Europe trip, not forever, just for one or two years. Just yep. like get, get, your, get your foundational piece set and then do all of those things, which is what I did. I did the 18 years old, bought a property, um, 20 or 21, bought the second one. Then did the Dubai and Europe trip, mm -hmm. had the two properties, spent too much money on the trips, hired the Lambos, did all the business class flights and all the rest of it. But I wasn't spending my whole net worth because the properties were growing faster than the money that I was spending. Even though I was spending my cash, and I was probably cash poor at the time, yep. the equity from those properties was growing at 5 7 10% per annum. Yep. Um, so delaying it, get the foundation, then do those things. Yes. Love it. Um one thing we've uh, we've got on our little list here is like the analytical thinker and like yes. someone who, you know, looks at a scenario, yeah. maybe takes a little bit longer to make the decision, but weighs up pros and cons of each thing. Yeah. And then once they've made the decision, they're all in. It's such a good point. It's so common with just successful people. It doesn't have to be in property. It can be in their career, just in life. <clears throat> they will, you'll present the information. They'll understand it. They'll, they'll have their list of questions to come back to you mm. they'll digest all that and they'll go away as you said it may be for a period of time but once they've that may be a no but if it's a yes they're in they execute so they go yes we're going to go and get this property this is our this is the brief and off they go they don't get clouded by what they read in the media log on to you know news.com.au mm. this is what it's saying rates are doing this property's doing this whereas the people that get sort of caught up in what's going on externally they get that analysis paralysis. They can't make a decision. They sit on their hands. It's too hard. And then that just gets put to the back burner and they move on. Five years down the track, they're still sitting there. Um, so I think it's about, it's, it's two pieces to that. It's like being analytical and assessing the scenario for what it is, mm -hmm. but then also being an action taker and execution, right? 
And that's what you, you listen to all the greatest entrepreneurs in the world. And it's like ideas are everything, right? How many people said they had the idea for Facebook? How many people said they had the idea for Uber? How many people said they had the idea for all these mega companies? Yeah. One person had the idea and executed on it. And obviously, they're the people who, who reap the rewards. Um, and, 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 and something with this as well is like often when we're going along this journey and I'm thinking about a, a client that we helped um, there's things that will get in the way, there's roadblocks and there's things that are very easy to knock you off track mm-hmm. and then for you just to go, oh, no, let's put this on the back burner and worry about it later. But often later never comes because you put it on the back burner, life gets in the way and you keep going. So I remember we had this client, like we were on a property, found it, all the DD was done, ready to uh, ready to purchase and, uh, and his partner, they were buying it together, his partner got made redundant, like given the notice. And all of a sudden, like that, he was, you know, it was a very nervous time. And they're like, no, no, let's, let's stop this. Let's get into a new role. Like, let's get my partner into a new role and then we'll revisit it. Mm-hmm. And I had to be like, no, let's not do that. How long is it? Like, what's the worst case scenario it's going to take your partner to get into a new role? Even if you had to choose the job you didn't want to do. Three months? Yeah. Like we're in Australia here. If you're half decent, you have a resume, you walk into someone, you're going to get a job straight away. So I said, you got three months to get a new job. You, let's let's go a longer settlement so you don't have to worry about holding costs for three months. So you got three months to not worry about holding costs and get a new job. Mm-hmm. But let's type of thing to say we don't do that. We cancel this property, push that to the back burner. Christmas comes around, you get a new job, you get into the new year and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, but look, rates are you know, a bit uneasy. Yep. 12, 24, 36 months go by, you never do it. You do, you do end up then, cause, cause, because, and this often happens, when you don't do something, you're disappointed in yourself Often, then you will go and um, you know try and buy yourself a bit of happiness. You yeah. Know, you go, oh, we didn't buy the property, so let's let's do the trip this year. Yeah. You know, or let's buy the car. All these things that are not good. Yeah. Because you don't do something, you go and do that. Yeah. You know, often you see it with relationship breakups. They save the deposit or something, and then all of a sudden they don't do it, and then all of a sudden all that money they saved goes onto something to fill that hole for a little period of time. Um, but anyway, we did it. I said, like, if I was in your shoes, this is what I would do because I see this time and time again where you put it on the back burner and you never do it. I said, yep, yeah, we agree. Let's do it. I said, worst case scenario, I'll buy the property off. Everything will be okay. So they did it. Bang. Straight away, got the new gig and set it on the property and, and we're off to the races. Yep. And now, because they did that 12 months ago, the market moved 10% or something. So mm-hmm. that one decision made them 90 grand or something in, in equity growth. Correct. Yep. So... Uh, that's the analytical and the and the action taker, and you know you then do the compounding effects of that decision, and it's significantly greater. And I think that's it goes back to the accountant having just good people around you hold you accountable, right? Other that's professionals. The thing. It's accountability. Like the, I think the thing with all professions is like they have the role to play, but if someone actually wants you to win, you know, like I know for myself when I'm getting up in the morning to go training, if it's just me getting myself up, yeah, it's very easy to go fuck. It's raining. I'll train this afternoon or I can't be bothered or I'm a little bit tired this morning. You give yourself excuses. But if I know I'm going with someone or someone's going to be at my front door at 5.15 in the morning to go running, you don't think those things because there's that person there that you like, keeps you accountable, right? Correct. And it's the same in like wealth and, and, and you know, telling people your goals who will then keep you accountable. Their service is great, but it's the knowing that someone's going to be like, hey, man, how are you going with your goals? Hey, you know, you said you were going to do this and, and you're not doing it. Yeah. So... Um, that's the important part of your team. So that, that's the building wealth piece as well, which is like um, delayed gratification, building a foundation early, which gives you the options down the track. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, understanding leverage and the power that can, can have and the options it can give you mm-hmm. in life. You know, yep. whether your business goes bad, like I just mentioned with that guy and you can leverage off the property or whether it's you want to get into a business, you need some working capital or whether it's you got the wedding coming up, you know, you could potentially use a bit of equity for the wedding or whatever it is. You've got options, but if you don't do those things early, you don't have the options. Mm-hmm. Um, making sure your living expenses don't increase with your income increase because when you go from like your 20s to your 30s and your 30s to your 40s, your 30s to your 40s is your biggest income growth, generally speaking, right? Because you yep. build 10 years of your career, you get into that management or the middle management or the CEO role and then your income skyrockets. Yeah. And you would see that, right? Definitely. I mean, and that's... It's interesting when, when clients have kids, you know, the, the, the mum normally goes into what you call the nesting phase. So mm. they'll get the house ready for the children. Uh, but then I think, I think the dad kind of goes into this delayed gratification phase of, of really going back to their bare bones in terms of their lifestyle. Because mm. it's all about the kids. Kids can be expensive. You know, you've got childcare, you've got all those expenses. 
but what I do see is that the dads that are still working hard, they're very, as you said, they're starting to get that real, that J curve in terms of their income, fantastic, but they're starting to really just strip back on their expenses. So they're mm-hmm. weak. And I see this in Sydney all the time. You go to the park on a Sunday and a dad that's incredibly successful, got a couple of kids and that's their Sunday. Mm. So, you know, you got someone who's 35 earning really, really good money and that's what they're doing on a Sunday versus someone in their 20s, they're trying to, you know, tour around Europe on, on borrowed money. So it's very interesting, that mindset change. The shift. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And then let, let, let's then push the time frame out again. We've gone from our mid-30s to 40s and then you're late, maybe looking at clients now that are in late 40s, mid-50s, early 60s, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And it's about they're keeping the wealth piece. They've built it and now it's about enjoying it, doing whatever you want to do. So what do you see with those those particular clients and um, what have they done to keep the wealth and what are they then doing to get to a stage where they don't necessarily need to trade their time for money or, or be pushing hard in their career? Yeah, so I think a key is they, they've got a really good tax structure in place for mm. the whole family. Um, and they understand, you know, there's obviously you can do things, set up your tax affairs legally in a way that's going to minimize the tax that you need to pay in a legal fashion mm. uh, and they're utilizing what's available to them so that goes back to you know accountant good structure good education so they know because once you what a lot of people start to learn is once you make a decision or put something in place it's very hard to unwind that mm. so it's about having that knowledge before you you know making sure you buy that in the in the right entity maybe it's in the right person's name and this this was the piece I was talking about when I said remember this later in the podcast the same decisions that take a long time to undo if you make the wrong decisions is the same as like a hex debt. Correct. Getting a thirty, fifty, seventy thousand dollar hex debt can take a long time to undo if it's the wrong decision. Correct. Um, and you, you're talking now about people who have really built significant wealth and are at the stage where they can enjoy it. It's because they've made the right decisions that over the long term have compounded positively. Correct. And then it's just being smart. So you may get into that position. Again, it comes down to, to lifestyle and, and what they want to achieve, but... You, you may have a pro- property portfolio and some other assets that are yielding income and it's it's how you're going to reinvest that income is it to pay down the non-deductible debt mm-hmm. in sort of like a debt recycling fashion and really accelerate that your income plus the other streams to get that down and then all of a sudden the, the debt in your portfolio is all deductible great but then also thinking okay if you're starting to wind down your own income does it make sense around the structure and do you have a property that's negatively geared? Mm. Is is that giving you the best benefit? Do you need to start to unwind some of those properties, perhaps put them in a different structure um, to make sure that, again, it goes back to that tax effective piece? Because, and we just did a full episode on this with um, with Ryan King, but a lot of people ask the question around how do I earn more money? Everyone eventually will hit an income cap, right? Whether you're the CEO of Australia's biggest company, like the Woolworths CEO just exited, like he, that was probably his max income he'll ever earn, right? So everyone, everyone hits an income cap uh, eventually, but regardless of what you earn, the, the, the one of the easiest ways to increase your net income position mm-hmm. is to be effective with your tax. Yeah. Because it takes minimum thirty percent away from you, maximum you know forty five. Yeah. Fifty percent of it away from you. Correct. So if we can be more effective with in, instead of earning uh, increasing our top line, or if we're struggling to increase our top line, let's increase our bottom line, which is okay. We're paying. $70,000 a year, $60,000 a year, $30,000 a year in tax, how do we minimize that to only pay $20,000 a year or $10,000 mm-hmm. a year? And with the money we're saving, we're investing. It's helping us grow our wealth. Like Correct. that's the positive stuff. And the way that the ATO you know, structures or the taxation system is structured in most economies is you will be incentivized if you invest. You will be incentivized if you're trying to grow your own wealth, whether it be through property or other asset classes, you will get tax breaks, you will get deductions, you will get incentives. Yep. Um, which is a good thing. Correct. And so, you know, in terms of long-term holding on to wealth, and I'm, and I'm having these conversations more regularly than I was a few years ago, and I think because of the housing crisis, it's top of everyone's mind in Australia. So you're now, I'm, I'm, I'm having sort of more what you might call like an everyday mum and dad with a couple of kids, thinking more front of mind around how do we set our kids up so what you've got to be mindful of is there's a lot of families at the dinner table right now having that conversation around how do we set up Jane and Joe who are 10 years old for when they get to 20? Um, and so that could be, go back to that, that sort of family trust, having something set up to help them on their property journey. 
and just to think about that's more people are starting to think more long term which i don't think i don't think that was in the australian psyche maybe mm. five ten years ago agreed and just on that um i think one of the really big hacks for wealth creation for children mm-hmm. where the parents will get a huge benefit out of it and uh and i recommend if you're watching this video explore what an investment bond is an education bond do you understand what they are correct yeah incredible yeah contributions of which are taxed when they're going in. When you get to a certain point, they then become Mm tax-free. So it's like a mini superannuation of which you can access much earlier in your life. Yep. Um, There are rules and regulations around it, but for people who are thinking about how do we make sure our kids don't necessarily have to worry about money or go through what we went through, whether you think that's a positive or a negative, Mm -hmm. I actually think that people going through hardship and hard things is a positive for them, not a negative. But if you're one of those people who wants to give your kids a better start in life, then exploring what an investment bond is and going hard into an investment bond with any surplus income or or anything you can, um, getting advice around it is a very, very powerful tool because it is like what I would describe as a mini superannuation of which you can invest into. It is obviously tax, like I said, but if you invest to a certain point, when you get to that point, it becomes tax-free. Yep. Which is incredible. And the reason it it is like that is because the government incentivizes people to plan for their future, Mm -hmm. make sure they are less of a burden on the taxation system and the the Australian government. So they're incentivizing things like that. Correct, correct. And I do see there is a again different so there's some there's some subcultures within australia where the families are very much focused on helping the kids out and you know like if you look at say my wife chinese so the chinese culture is very much about how do we help maybe even the grandkids so the generation down mm. but that's not the case for all families in australia the some culture it's well i've made my money i'm now retired i'm gonna go spend all that on you know cruises mm. fifty thousand dollar cruises every year and not help out the kids. I think the interesting thing, which is a completely off topic to wealth creation, do you know Alex Hormozzi? Have you heard of him before? Yep. So he's like, I what can consume some of his content. And, and Alex Hormozzi talks about if we wanted to create the most resilient, the hardest working, the best family man or woman, um, you know, someone who's dedicated, someone who wants the best of their life, and we needed to put them in an environment and shape them into that person, how would you do it? Would you do it by showering them in gifts and love and money so they didn't have to ever work or go through any hardship? Or would you turn them into that person by challenging them, putting them through hardship, making them learn the hard way, and eventually they get to a point, right? So often you see with with culture and you look at it right now, it's like um, even with my own parents, the reason they are so successful in their own right is because Mm. they went through so much hardship and so much shit in their early life which formed them into resilient people, which formed them into people who have a certain worldview who are very interdependent as opposed to dependent. Yeah. Um, whereas I think now most people are trying to give the kids the, the things that they didn't have in their life. But what they don't realize is the things they haven't, they didn't have in their early years of their life are the things that actually made them into who they are right now. Where if it's the opposite, if you give the kids and give them everything, then they're going to go through life with this learned helplessness, which is, well, what do you mean I can't just have a handout what do you mean i have to yeah. you know actually go through hardship like i've never had to experience this before so it's a, such an interesting dynamic right because parents don't want their kids to go through what they went through yep. but what they don't realize a lot of the time is the reason they are who they are is because they went through those things correct correct so, i don't know if my little brother fuck be- their good clips there's going to be two very good clips in that thank you <laughs> i was gonna say i don't know if, if uh my little brother will be watching but he 25 still lives at home yeah he may fall into that second bucket and yeah. He had his first full-time job and I called him, spoke to him first week. How's it going? He goes, I can't believe people get up every day at 6 a.m. and go to work. Like, this is not for me. So That right there, folks, is called <laughs> learned helplessness. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and again, that can do two things. If, he, if your brother goes, I can't believe people have to get up every morning and go to work at 6 a.m. I'm going to make sure I never have to do this. And Correct. gives them drive. That is great, but I would say for the most part, they fall into the other They want to sit at home like, and play the PlayStation. Fuck this. I, <laughs> when's mum and dad going to die so I can get the inheritance, you know? It's interesting. It's interesting. But I think all of those things that we've covered off, like, and none of that stuff's revolutionary. Everyone's heard it before. It's like, start early in your life, have a slight amount of delayed gratification, and it's mm-hmm. not even like an excessive amount of delayed gratification. You know, the thing that I talk about all the time is, in New South Wales right now, a 5% deposit, no lenders, mortgage insurance, no stamp duty. It's like you can get into a five hundred thousand dollar property for twenty five grand. 
you will go and spend 20 you will you will beg borrow on steel to get 25 grand to go to europe yep because everyone's there every second year third year people are traveling turkey wherever it is but you won't do it to buy a house but you 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 do it to buy a house and the reality is you don't have to make one good financial decision for the next 10 years and that property or investment will just tick over and tick over and make sure that once you get to the 30s which is the building wealth phase you've already got a foundation to build off and you can have a much stronger head start. Yep. And then you get to that later year in the life of what we're talking about and uh, and it's happy and dandy. Correct. Yep. I agree. Very interesting stuff, Mr. Harper. Anything? Closing words? No, that's it. That was a very, very good podcast. What do you reckon, Joel? Yeah. You got notes? Right. There we go. Look at that. There's a few clips in that. All right, folks. See you next week. This is general advice and does not take into consideration your objectives, situation, or needs. You should consider if this advice is suitable to you or your circumstances, and please read any applicable PDS beforehand. This is a Henderson podcast production.